Okay, yeah, thank you for, for the nice introduction. Um, so quantum technology is now booming, but where does it come from? So we all have heard of the famous Einstein-Bohr debate discussions uh, about a century ago. And I, can, uh, I guess today it is fair to say that in some sense Bohr was correct, in the sense that quantum predictions work absolutely remarkably well. But I think it's also fair to say it is the kind of questions that Einstein raised that led to what is today quantum technology with a long history, but it's really asking the questions which is, which is relevant here, not just to be merely correct. And so how does, it, then I'm going to make a pretty quick jump, uh, actually to here, to CERN, where uh, John Bell picked up this debate but instead of just continuing a debate, he turned the entire stuff into experimental physics by deriving what is called now Bell inequalities, so deriving um, the possibility, making it possible to do experiments and not just to debate. And that's, of course, an enormous step. And maybe here I also want to say something a bit more about John Bell. Well, first, I met him in person, so that's, of course, very, also a bit emotional for me to talk about uh, John Bell. Um, so he published his, uh, his famous paper. The official date is 1964. And the journal essentially immediately collapsed after that. Not his fault, I guess. And another thing that happened almost simultaneously, he, he wrote a review paper on, on, on his ideas. Uh, and that review paper was sent to a famous journal, the Journal uh, Re Review of Modern Physics, um, who lost the paper and didn't really pay much attention. You know, it was just John Bell talking about these quantum foundations, no interest. And so for, for that reason, first of all, the review paper appeared with a huge delay of several years. And secondly, John Bell never published anything any longer in a serious journal with you know, all these refer referee reports and all that. So uh, he decided to only publish when he was talking about uh, foundations of physics, of quantum physics, he only published in uh, proceedings of conferences or in minor philosophy journals. Um, nevertheless, these papers are all worth to the reading. We contain a, a lot of uh, uh, enormous insight. But so it means also that, uh, especially maybe for the young guys here, if your paper gets rejected, it doesn't mean that the paper is bad. By the way, it also doesn't mean that the paper is good. <laughs> it just means that you are not working in mainstream physics. So don't worry about that. Um, Maybe one thing more before I hand over about John Bell to, to, jo to this John, uh, John Ellis. Um, so once I, I managed to invite uh, John Bell to give a, a seminar for, for students and postdocs, I was myself a, a very young postdoc, and it happened in some basement of some, okay, some place, and so the students were sitting on the floor. It was not an official place like here. And John stood up, and he started his presentation with words which I still remember very vividly. He started by saying, I am a quantum engineer, but on Sundays I have principles. And I think today we are doing quantum technologies. We'll see much more about that. And this is also my activity. I made my, my living out of that. I'm still working. I still enjoy doing that. But remember, on Sundays we should have principles. You know, so going back to the foundation, asking the right questions, the deep and difficult questions, is also something which we should be doing. And I wish that quantum technology doesn't, you know, blow away the principles and only do technology. Technology will, will bring, uh, I hope, a lot of good for, for humanities. We'll talk about that. But uh, let's remember John Bell's word. Okay, so that is just my very first part, and now I turn to, to you, John, and uh, yeah, and we continue this kind of dialogue. Okay, so I just yeah, yes, you. Thank you. So I, I just prepared a, a couple of slides. 
so I, I regard uh, John Bell as being a sort of a quantum prophet, along with all sorts of other quantum things. And uh, just to remind people, uh, John Bell spent about uh, 30 years at CERN. He uh, had a very interesting background. Uh, he made some very fundamental contributions to uh, quantum field theory uh, before he came to CERN. Uh, but I think one of the main reasons why he was brought to CERN was uh, his uh, distinction as an accelerator physicist. But uh, I, I was trying to look through his publications before 1964 to see whether I could find a sort of a warning that uh, <laughs> Bell inequalities were going to happen. And, and I couldn't find anything. It just somehow appeared. Uh, and, uh, well, we'll be talking a lot about Bell inequalities uh, later on. Uh, uh, as you know, they lead to uh, long-range correlations which are much larger than in classical physics. Uh, the quantum effects are very different from Bertelmann socks, for example. We made a famous paper about Bertelmann socks. And, uh, of course, uh, the fact that these inequalities should be violated in quantum mechanics was uh, verified uh, later in particular. I remember experiments by Alain Aspe and, uh, and collaborators. Uh, and of course nowadays uh, they're finding prospective applications in uh, quantum uh, cryptography, but I guess that's something that Nicolas is going to say a bit more about. Uh, so, so John Bell was a sort of very private individual. I, I remember that uh, in theory department staff meetings, you, know, you had to turn to John and say, John, what do you think about this? Uh, and when he said something, it was usually something very important and, and very profound that was worthwhile trying to uh, extract from him. Uh, anyway, one of the things that we did, it must have been about oh, 35 years ago, was uh, we had this list of people in the theoretical physics department and uh, we asked people to write down what were their research interests. And uh, I remember John Bell declaring quantum engineering, which, which I think actually was his way of uh, giving the finger to this idea of listing your research interests. And then thanks in large part to Nicolau and collaborators, quantum <coughs> engineering became a thing so then he had to change his research interest to something that he thought was clearly ridiculous. Quantum cosmology. Uh, but of course now we know that all the structures in the universe are supposed to emerge from quantum processes in the very early universe. Uh, so I, I don't know what John might have expressed as his interest following that if he hadn't met a regrettably premature death. Maybe he would have talked about quantum finance, but that's a thing now as well. <laughs> so I, I don't know. I don't know uh, which way he would have uh, gone. Uh, anyway, uh, there's of course a direct connection between uh, John Bell's uh, theoretical work and uh, the experimental program that uh, Nicola uh, initiated, uh, looking at uh, violations of Bell inequalities, long range correlations. <laughs> At one time between Geneva and CERN, that was a big distance. And subsequently, that work's been taken to much bigger distances between the Canary Islands. Chinese have now verified inequality violation in messages uh, sent through satellites. And uh, people are now talking about space experiments, looking for violations of bell inequalities, or not, as the case may be, uh, between the Earth and Moon. But that's maybe getting too far into the future. Anyway, so Nicola, I'll hand it back to you. Okay, yeah, thank you. Yeah, so indeed, after so John Bell and his uh, inequalities, of course, people then wanted to do the experiment. Um, and actually, the very first experiment was done in the US <coughs> by a team led by uh, John Clauser. Actually, the team, I think, consisted of two persons, so it was not a cell-like team. Um, and they violated, indeed, Bell inequalities. Um, and then there was a second experiment, still in the US, that actually did not violate Bell inequality. So if that would be a, a football game, you would just say one-to-one. -one. And that's actually why, actually, at the end, the main experiment, which is cited by everyone today, is, 
is a series of experiments performed by Alain Aspect and his team that you already mentioned in Paris, so in Europe. And this actually uh, really moved this entire interest back to Europe. Of course, uh, uh, John Bell was in Europe, that's clear. But then the experiments and all the technology for the experiments, not for the application, just to do, to play with these photons and these amazing correlations, uh, happened mostly in, in Europe. Uh, people like uh, Anton Zeilinger, okay, uh, myself, several others. And so uh, this was also, this is probably still the reason why quantum technology is actually very strong today in Europe. Uh, I think it's fair to say that at least in quantum communication, maybe not for quantum computing, but for quantum communication, Europe is leading, uh, maybe now with China also coming very strongly. And this is really because we had already the, the experimental tools to do that. Um, so, but so what happened? You know, now we have experimental physics. We can violate Bell inequalities and be fascinated. It is fascinating. Okay, I'm not telling you about Bell inequalities, but it is fascinating because you really have some. It really shows that with quantum physics, you can do things which are completely unthinkable. That's also why Einstein didn't believe in that. It was unthinkable, un impossible in Einstein's eyes. But today, this is really a, a fact. Um, but then the next uh, big step happened in the very early 90s, so 30 years ago, more or less. In 91, more precisely, where a, a young Polish student who was doing his PhD in Oxford, in the UK, uh, noticed that actually these quantum correlations, the data that come out of these kind of experiments, are precisely a cryptographic key. Uh, because you know, it's random, it's the same on both sides, and it's private. So this is exactly what you need as a password or a cryptographic key. And so Eckert somehow turned this experimental quantum uh, physics into applied physics, because now it was potentially useful. And then you can apply for money and say, I'm going to make uh, you know, the world a better place because it will be safer. Because of, I have a way of distributing a cryptographic key, not with the old uh, mathematical complexity uh, theory, but by modern physics, quantum physics in this case. Actually, the idea was already uh, in the air and had even been published by uh, Bennett and Brassard uh, years before that, in 84, except that this was done in a small conference in India and it was a computer science conference, so no physicist really reacted to that. And there was also another guy, Wiesner, who had very similar ideas, tried to publish it, but you know, not mainstream physics. He didn't manage to publish a single paper. Um, but uh, Arthur Eckert's paper was a physical review letters, serious journal. So sometimes it's uh, sometimes you need to go to these kind of journals, uh, although it was at that time not yet mainstream. But the idea was probably understandable. The guy writes; I mean, the paper is very clear. So it, it was it, it was this this enormous step. And after that, already in the 90s, a lot happened because in 93 then came uh, quantum teleportation and then in 95, quantum error correction. So all that actually happened in a few years in the, in the 90s. And um, yeah, and that was really uh, putting all the, the essence, the basement, the, the basics needed to, to launch quantum technology. And maybe just to say that, so indeed, so in Geneva, the university, we did, okay, this demonstration that you have on the board now between the university and CERN, but it was a triangle, so it was, must have been a, a third place, I in Jussi, I see here. Okay, and we did, okay, also Geneva, Lausanne, so longer distances, but mostly also to push more on the really application, so to have all these in, in little boxes, uh, kind of telecom boxes that you can put in a, in a telecom station and that, you, that uh, I don't know, a banker can use. You know, a banker doesn't understand and doesn't need to understand quantum physics, but he should be able to just use it like any other box. Quantum finance. Quantum finance, okay, we don't do that ourselves. But um, 
in its of is a company that uh, is a spin-off of my university group, ID Quantique. Today we often say just IDQ, um, and, uh, and they are at least outside China clearly the, the, the world leader today, uh, commercializing these, commercializing also random number generator, quantum random number generator, and uh, actually now in uh, but only in Korea you can even buy. Uh, what we call a quantum phone, which is just a standard Samsung phone, except that there's a little chip, two millimeter over two millimeter, low power consumption, that really produces, uses quantum physics to produce random numbers. Essentially, it's just a photon on a beam splitter, two single photon detectors. Very simple, at the conceptually very simple, but in terms of technology, to put all that into a, one of these smartphones, I find very remarkable. And I hope that we'll soon be able to buy this in, uh, in Europe. If Samsung sells it here, I will stop with iPhone and switch to Samsung. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so this is now the situation. That that's probably also what is the basis why all that exists here and why do we have a quantum day and a, a quantum uh, a technology initiative. <coughs> and a lot is happening in Europe and worldwide. Okay, so, so I'm going to pick up the uh, baton now with, with something rather different. So uh, one of the things that I think we want to discuss is uh, you know, what is the role of CERN in this uh, second quantum revolution? And uh, there's uh, an aspect that uh, interests me personally, which is a new generation of quantum uh, experiments. Well, of course, all the experiments that we do at CERN are quantum in some sense, because we use quantum field theory to calculate processes at the LHC. But there are specific quantum effects which can be very powerful uh, tools for, uh, for doing physics, uh, in, in particular interferometry. Well, of course, we're all familiar with uh, laser interferometers, such as the ones used by Le uh, LIGO and Virgo to discover gravitational waves. But uh, one thing which I think is very promising for the future is to look at interference between atoms. Uh, so you shine a laser on a, a cloud of atoms, you excite some of them, and they get kicked and they follow a different path from the ones that are not excited and then you have them meet up again and you get uh, interference fringes as uh, illustrated on this slide. And uh, this is something which uh, various groups around the world are interested in uh, applying to the detection of gravitational waves and also uh, ultralight dark matter. And this is one of my own personal interests. I'm a member of a collaboration in the UK called Aon, which is uh, developing the technology for, for building such detectors. Uh, so, uh, as I mentioned, we're interested in looking for dark matter, not the same sort of dark matter as uh, you look for with LHC experiments, where typically you're looking for massive individual particles. But you can look for uh, clouds spread through the universe of uh, coherent uh, waves of ultralight bosons. And that's something that you can do with Aeon. And uh, this slide here illustrates the fact that you're sensitive to properties of that ultralight dark matter, which are orders of magnitude beyond what can be uh, reached with, uh, with other techniques. So you might ask, well, what has this got to do with CERN? And uh, so we've been looking around for where might be uh, the ideal location for the uh, next generation of such detectors. And it could be that the ideal location is here at CERN. So you, you want to uh, project atomic clouds on vertical trajectories up and down. Uh, so you want a vertical shaft. Uh, CERN's got a lot of vertical shafts going down to the LHC. And uh, we've identified one which I think would be uh, ideal, uh, potentially, for doing a, a next generation atom interferometer experiment. So this is something that uh, we're discussing actively with uh, uh, engineers at CERN, and so far we haven't found any showstoppers, so m maybe that's something that we might do in the future. Uh, anyway, that, that, that's you know, looking at principle of superposition, interference, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but all that is assuming that quantum mechanics works fine. Uh, another thing which I'm personally interested in, which 
goes a long way beyond CERN, is uh, an experiment called uh, STE Quest that we are currently proposing to the European Space Agency, which uh, was originally conceived as a, a way of probing gravity uh, in a free fall. You can look for non-universality of free fall violations of the principle of equivalence. But you can also use it as a probe of quantum mechanics. And uh, this uh, last slide here shows you how you can uh, probe uh, the potential modification of uh, quantum mechanics by wave function collapse over time scales and ranges which are very different from those that have been explored so far in other experiments. So I, I just mentioned that as a possible quantum experiment uh, for the future. Uh, anyway, I, I shouldn't say too much more about quantum experiments at CERN because that's what uh, Michal is going to talk about. So um, I'll stop there. Yeah, maybe I just add that uh, John Bell was very interested in this uh, GRW, so Girardi Rimini Weber modification of Schrodinger equation. And myself also, I also contributed to that. I think you also have some papers on that kind of right, uh, I, modification. I wrote something about that in 1984 before Girardi Rimini and Weber. But Okay, yeah, me too, but, but, but not the GRW model itself. So anyway, and, and John Bell was certainly very interested in that, so uh, indeed that would be a... Uh, but again, and that's also, you need a lot of technology to do that, uh, quantum technology, but of course probing the foundations of quantum physics, this is more on the principal side. So it's perfect if we can combine the, the applications and the principles. Thank you. So, uh, as you said earlier on, we, we need principles. But on the other hand, we also sometimes hope that they're violated. Absolutely. <laughs> yes. <laughs> this is a good moment to ask a, a few questions. Anything you, you want to know of the future of quantum professions, from quantum engineering, cosmology, finance, biology? Any question? I have a question on your know, technology and principle. I, I don't know. In, in terms of technology, one, as, as far as I know, one of the main challenges today in, uh, in uh, making quantum communication usable, widespread uh, in production, is uh, the need to, to store, amplify quantum yeah. states as they are transmitted. What is the, the state of the art? Uh? in this today. Yes, so you're right, just sending a photon from A to B, I mean, I think some people send it 500 kilometers, but in a very academic environment, not in, in an industrial application, which are more limited to maybe 100, 200 kilometers. So then you need a repeater, but you cannot clone a quantum state, you cannot just duplicate, so you cannot do the same as with classical uh, communication, classical optical communication, we just have a, an amplifier, it's very similar to just a laser. It's a, it's a medium that does just stimulated and spontaneous emission. That is impossible because the spontaneous emission would kill your, your signal because you arrive with a single photon essentially. So that doesn't work. So indeed you need to, well you need several things, but one of the critical, the most critical element are quantum memories. So do you, you have your, your quantum states carried by a photon should be stored somewhere for a fraction of a second, I don't know, 100 milliseconds or something like that. And then on demand should come out again, keeping all the quantum properties. So if it was entangled with another one, it has to remain entangled. Exactly the same state. And uh, so there are people, it's a very active uh, field of research in Geneva, okay, I started it, but now there are people continuing that at the University of Geneva, but also many other places. And um, somehow every of the single parameter, critical parameter, you know, the efficiency, the time duration, the time jitter, uh, the, the multiplexing, multiplexing is also very important. You need to be able to store many in parallel. So every single uh, parameter has been achieved and demonstrated, but in incompatible systems. So now we need to find a way to put everything into a, one and the same system before we can really uh, it's, yeah, talk about industrialization of such a quantum repeater. 
but it's it's in the pipeline and i think this is really super exciting physics the technology is very clear and the application very clear it's also exciting because you can think okay now i have to, in, in our case in the, the university everything gets stored in a crystal the crystal is a centimeter long something you can really hold in your hand and you can see it with your naked eye it's clearly a macroscopic thing and it's holding all these um, many quantum states can be thousand quantum states qubits as we say these quantum bits so do we have now kind of macroscopic quantum effects here in some sense this is macroscopic but in some sense it's only a few excitations even thousand is not such a huge number for a solid state uh, matter um, so and again you can also go and think about what does it really mean you know on sundays i have principles so on Sundays, you can be thinking about that all while you spend your week working on as a quantum engineer. Any other question? Yes. Uh, I have a question for John. Could you explain more in detail your, the experiment Aeon that you uh, proposed to uh, the Physics Beyond Collider program? So, 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 so the, it doesn't, of course, directly involve the LHC. It just uses the LHC access shaft. So uh, what you would do would be you would have uh, so-called side arms, which uh, inject clouds of uh, atoms into this uh, vertical shaft. Then you uh, hit uh, those atoms with uh, a laser. So some of them you would excite. And the ones that you excite... Uh, then start moving, whereas the ones that are not excited would, would, would not move. Well, you, you might throw the, uh, the cloud up you know, like a ball, okay, but uh, relative to that motion, uh, the ones that are not excited would not be moving. Then you uh, hit another pulse and uh, hit the cloud with another pulse, and then some of the atoms will be sent back to the ground state, and some of the ground state ones will be excited. So you can do this you know, many, many, many times. Okay. And so you know, statistically, you can build up a, a large number of momentum transfers between uh, different components of the cloud. And uh, they will follow different paths. They will follow a sort of, uh, uh, in some sense, a sort of uh, hist what looks like a hysteresis loop. And uh, so, so that, then you can look for changes in the interference pattern uh, between the atoms that follow different paths and uh, that like the, uh, the light beams in the LIGO or Virgo will be sensitive for example to uh, uh, the passage of a gravitational wave or uh, possibly interactions with uh, clouds of light dark matter. D does that answer your question? Yes. <laughs> I should probably look at the proposal. Yes. I wanted to ask, just, it just came to my mind now, uh, another question. So in a, for an experiment like this, do you think we could think of not measuring the data? The data is quantum in, in principle. Could we not measure it and try to, to directly use quantum computing to analyze it at some point? This is the Sunday part, or? Saturday. <laughs> 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 uh, I, I don't know. Right now, that seems to me a, a little bit ambitious. So the, the, the measurement techniques of the uh, of the atom clouds are, are quite, quote unquote, traditional. Right? Uh, but uh, yeah, maybe we should be thinking about that. In the future. Thank you. <laughs> thanks. Okay. Thanks a lot. Thanks again, John.